Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anything I send you, Craig, you need to clean up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm not really cleaning up my. My. I meant, you know, I got to add the right names, and oh, it's just been a mess today. All right, I think we're ready to let them in. Um. And I Jared. can't see the screen, so let them. So you guys talk to me about who's here and. Um. Okay, are we ready to go, everyone? I think we are. So we'll start by saying welcome to the MU Extension Forage and Livestock Hour. This was previously called the Forage Livestock Town Hall. That began during COVID, and we began uh, holding these virtual sessions with the public, and they are recorded. It's our way to address current hot topics in forages and in livestock, and there's quite a bit of focus on beef. And today, I will be your host. My name is Craig Roberts. I'm a state extension forage crop specialist, also professor at the University of Missouri. And the co-host is Wesley Tucker, uh, who is an ag economist. And uh, where are you now, Wesley? Are you in Bolivar? Yes, sir. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, you will be contacting Wesley through the Ask Questions Here window. Um, our agenda for today, we will get a weather report from Dr. Pat Ganan. Then we have a guest uh, with us this morning, uh, Joe Lauer. Dr. Lauer from the University of Wisconsin has done a lot of work on, on forage silage. We'll talk about corn silage. This is a hot topic because uh, normally we produce silage later in the year, but because of our drought in the bottom two thirds of Missouri, people are cutting forage now, so, uh, cutting corn now as forage. So thank you, Joe, for, for hopping on early in this sort of a emergency session with us. And we'll conclude with the economics of corn silage production. Again, asking questions. In the bottom center of your screen, there's a chat button. And you will choose ask questions here and go ahead and type in your question and we'll get to that. Wesley will forward those questions to all of us. And Wesley, I'm going to count on you as a co-host to um, manage the, the noise background because I cannot see everybody on, on the. So if you want to feel free to mute those who, who have background noise. <clears throat> Our IPM. YouTubes are live, but they are recorded, and you can find the old ones here at this address, youtube.com, see MUIPM live. I think we'll go ahead and begin with Pat Ganan, and I'll stop share. And Pat, if you want to give us a weather report, that would be great. Sounds good. Thanks, Craig. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, the new drought monitor map, which updates weekly, just was released this morning. Doesn't not real surprising. Obviously, uh, there's been some big uh, continued expansion of this degradation of drought uh, intensities across our state, especially the southern half of Missouri. Uh, we currently have nearly half the state, a little over half the state, experiencing some form of drought category D1 or greater. Uh, and this right here, this area of bright red is a D3. That is an extreme drought condition that just was uh, upgraded um, with this newest map. It impacts uh, six counties. It actually nips far southeastern corner of Ozark County, Howell County, Oregon County, Shannon County, Carter County, and Western Ripley County extreme drought. 53 counties are experiencing D2 or greater, six experiencing D3. Just not a good situation, and the impacts are really mounting across this area. On the left, uh, looking over the past week, it's, uh, it's, so, it's just been an amazing disparity 
I really can't recollect over the many years I've been here, the differences in the, how bad it gets when you go south through Missouri. Northern Missouri, they're going what drought? They've been getting the systems pretty much on a weekly basis of rainfall. It's lush and green across Northern Missouri, but as you go south, things quickly deteriorate. On the right, this is the, four, uh, this is the estimate of a contour map showing precip over about the past seven weeks. This is when this dry spell started in early June. <clears throat> you can see the numbers, five, seven, 10 inches of rain across Northern Missouri. And look how quickly they drop right here in mid-Missouri, right around Columbia. We've had less than an inch and a half since early June. Uh, and things continue. Look how bad it is back in these counties there that are in D3. They've had only a half to an inch of rain. And that's since the end of May. So they, even going back almost two months, so that this dry spell started in Northern Arkansas and far Southern and South Central Missouri in late May. Nonetheless, it's just really dry. These numbers are pathetic when you look at what you would anticipate over a seven week period during the heart of summer. <clears throat> and we're seeing the impacts. And unfortunately with the forecast over the next five days, uh, conditions will only continue to deteriorate, especially across the Southern half of Missouri. Look at these high temperatures today in the low 100s in this drought affected area. They persist into Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Even south, far southwest Missouri, they're still calling for 100, low 100s on Monday afternoon next week. There is a forecast of a boundary, a cold front to move sink southward into our state later this weekend. That will bring some chances of precipitation across northern Missouri, perhaps as early as Sunday. And hopefully it looks like those chances will spread southward to the rest of the state as we go into next week. Low temperatures will still be fairly high over the next several days. Lows only getting into the low to mid 70s. Look at these low temperatures on Sunday morning, low 80s. That's highly unusual to get low temperatures not getting below 80 degrees, but that's what they're forecasting on Sunday morning. Obviously with the drought, we're seeing all sorts of impacts. That includes wildfires. Uh, burn bans are starting to be uh, hoisted across much of Southern half of the state because of the drought. On the right, bottom right, they are forecasting that boundary to stall out next week. So <clears throat> hopefully we will get some better chances of precipitation across these drought affected areas with that boundary sticking around and bringing us day-to-day <clears throat> -day chances of showers and thunderstorms, especially mid into late week next week. <clears throat> this is the forecast of precipitation totals over the next seven days. Um, you know, it's not a lot, but it's, it's something, at least across uh, parts of southern and central Missouri, perhaps as much as a half to an inch. I do want to uh, caution, take this map with a grain of salt. Obviously, wherever these thunderstorms develop, they can drop a lot of rain in a short period of time. So this is a very generalized map. Uh, it doesn't look like much precip across far southern Missouri where they need it the most. Nonetheless, some areas affected, uh, drought affected areas of central and parts of south, central, southeast Missouri might get some decent rainfall next week. Hopefully these totals will get higher as we go into next week. So st stay tuned. It could obviously change, hopefully for the better. This is the forecast for next week. These temperatures, just these hot temperatures are going to stick around. I do see with more clouds and chances of precipitation, I doubt if we'll see many hundreds as we go into the middle and latter, latter part of next week, but still 90s are not out of the question. This is more encouraging on the right, this green indicating an enhanced likelihood of above average precipitation associated with that boundary that is forecast to stall out across central Missouri. Hopefully it'll verify because we do need the rain. I do want to emphasize, I, I mentioned this a lot, but I think it's very important. Uh, please participate in submitting your drought impact reports. They're very helpful. They're useful when it comes to assessing drought not only for Missouri, but across the country. So at the local, state, and national level, impact reports are very helpful. Who knows the drought better than a person who's living in that affected area? So uh, this is a great resource um, from the National Drought Mitigation Center based in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is the website here in blue on the bottom. You got to take you to this site, you submit a report. Here's the QR code to get to that resource. These are pictures I just grabbed off of the map from, the, from a couple of days ago, actually from yesterday, from Cooper County, just west of here. Howe County, look, the ponds are going dry. The corn is burning up in Dade County. Look at how bad the conditions are across 
looking at these pictures. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Please go to the site and submit your condition monitoring observer report. These are the reports as of this morning. We've had 136, what they call Seymour reports. Uh, and you can see, obviously, the drought monitor map overlaid, showing where these impact reports are coming from. And you can see here this bar graph on the bottom. These greens are indicating the, the ramping up of these reports. They continue to uh, accumulate as we go through the month of July. These are pictures, again, I grabbed from that website, uh, really showing what we're seeing across Southern and parts of Central Missouri with the burned up pastures, corn that is looking really bad and the ponds are going dry. So obviously a bad situation. And unfortunately, I do think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. I wanted to put this drought into perspective. Obviously uh, this drought continues to evolve but we have over 20 years of maps that go back to the drought monitor. So we have a pretty a, a climatology of drought here in Missouri using drought categories at the county level. And you can see, looking at drought is common. Growing season drought is common in Missouri. It's highly unlikely not for some area in Missouri to experience a drought. It's only happened three times. It's happened in 2004, it happened in 2008, and it happened in 2009. Usually every year during the growing season, somewhere in Missouri, we experienced drought. This year, obviously, is no exception to that. There are some areas that are seeing the worst drought conditions, at least according to these maps, in over a decade. You have to go back to 2012. Uh, again, this drought is emerging, it is evolving, and I unfortunately think it will continue to intensify as we go into the next several days. Hopefully a pattern change with the weather, with more rain next week, but um, that's where we stand now. Craig, that's a weather report. I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. And our next speaker is going to be Joe Lauer. And Joe, I guess Joe has been a friend of mine from days gone by, 15 years probably, a little too long maybe. But Joe is, is uh, pretty well known across the United States and other countries for his work in corn silage production. We've asked Joe as an expert to come down and visit with us a little bit about corn silage as forage. As we said earlier, normally this would be a talk we give later in the year, but because everyone is cutting their corn now, we need to get this in here. So thank you, Joe, for this, uh, for this talk given to us with hardly any notice at all. Thank you so much. And I'll let you share your slides. All right, thank you, Craig. <clears throat> All right, can people see them? Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, yes, well, thanks for that introduction, Craig, and interesting hearing the, uh, the weather report there. Um, uh, I think like, the, like uh, he said, that every year we see some sort of uh, drought somewhere uh, e across Wisconsin or across the U.S. So there's, there's always this possibility, always hurts though when it, when it happens to you. Um, what I was gonna do today was talk a little bit about corn silage as a forage. In other words, you don't get the grain production oftentimes that, um, that occurs with corn silage. And the point I wanna really get across here is that probably the best thing you can do is don't carry out revenge on this corn right now. Let the corn go through pollination and you've got time here uh, before you really um, need to need to start cutting and harvesting this. So, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, first of all, I got us, okay. First of all, I just wanna explain a little bit what I do. Um, we plant about 12 to 13,000 plots a year at 14 locations around the state of Wisconsin. Roughly half of those trials are, are um, hybrid evaluation trials for grain and silage. And the other half are, are um, are a um, uh, management trials. So what I do basically is uh, try to present to growers results. And, um, and that's what I'd spend a lot of my time uh, writing and speaking about. Uh, can, can you see the slides, Greg? Are they coming through? Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Yes, they're looking good. Okay, all right, good. Um, a little bit about the silage program here. Uh, for the hybrid trials, we have about 2,000 plots a year that we plant and harvest. 
And then for the management trials, we have about a thousand plots. And these are what we call paired plots where we plant eight rows, harvest four rows for silage, and then leave four rows for later grain harvest. And so we have a really good handle about what happens for the grain yield and quality, as well as a, for the silage yield and quality, as well as for the grain later on. All of our data has been converted to a, a measure called MELK 2006, and I'll explain this a little bit more uh, in a bit. What I wanted to do today um, was basically talk a little bit about um, just uh, the components of corn grain and silage yield and just what makes up that quality. I want to talk about the little bit about the relative changes that go on for silage yield and quality during development. And right now, of course, across most much of the country, we're in this tasseling silking stage. And um, I want to just kind of show what goes on after that. And then I want to talk a little bit about managing this uh, through periods of crop stress. Um, one of the things that um, um, uh, I wanted to mention too was that Bill Weebold really put together a nice article on the effects of high of hot temperatures on Missouri grain crops. And if you get a chance to read that, uh, Bill did a good job on kind of the underlying physiology of what of what goes on when you uh, when when crops experience a drought. And I just point you to that uh, to that uh, to that article. Well, uh, really, you know, when we talk about weather, you always prepare for the worst and pray for the best. We have a lot of crop insurance options right now that a lot of people use and bankers are requiring more and more because of the cost of, of, uh, of uh, growing corn. In the Midwest here, we're challenged by wet springs that usually when they're really wet, we just don't get the root uh, surface area that we need out there oftentimes, and this can oftentimes be expressed later on during pollination when we typically experience dry hot conditions that will affect kernel set and grain filling. I always figure that if you want, if you're, if you pray, you got to know what to pray for. And ideally we want springs that are wet enough to activate herbicides and promote good stands. We want a summer with timely rain about an inch per week. And what's comfortable for you is also comfortable for the corn plant. Uh, corn shuts down about above about 94 degrees, and it's usually expressed as pineappling of corn uh, and also a lot of kernel abortion that can occur on the year. In the fall, of course, we want fall, nice cloudy mild weather to extend the dry down rate and extend that harvest window. And then for grain, actually, we'd like to have a little bit of the opposite with sunny dry weather to speed down that uh, dry down and get that moisture down to 22% corn, moisture corn. Uh, we though have to accept the fact that mother nature's got the upper hand and, and years like this in Missouri where is where you really start to experience this. Although I think it's better given um, what's been some of the uh, technological advances that have gone on uh, with some of the uh, bioengineered crops that are out there. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. First of all, what makes a good forage? Um, uh, for uh, Paul Carter identified this way back, and, and forage agronomists have known this for a long time. You want high yield, high energy, or, or high digestibility of that forage. You want high intake potential or low fiber and high protein, and then, it, and then be able to harvest it at the right moisture so you can store it, preserve it for uh, feeding later on. And with the exception of protein, corn silage does a pretty good job in terms of identifying what makes a good forage. The ultimate test though is animal performance. And um, currently what we use at Wisconsin is something called Milk 2006, which is really the fourth iteration now of a model that basically takes into account yield of that forage as well as quality. We estimate the amount of milk in this case or beef or whatever can that can be be produced from a ton of silage. And then we multiply that quality or that, that milk per ton by the yield that we've got uh, in, that, uh, in that field to get at milk per acre. So those two things, yield and quality are estimated using this milk 2006 equation. The NRC has recently come out with new guidelines now that um, uh, we are going to do one more, another upgrade basically. I don't know what we're gonna call it, milk 
2022 or milk 2030, so we don't have to upgrade this very often in the future, but uh, we, we are making some adjustments to this milk 2006 based on these new NRC guidelines. There are a number of other ways this is done though. Um, at UW, we've got kind of a competing idea of total track NDFD, and then Cornell has got um, some, some approaches using undigested NDF after uh, a 10 day digestion period. So we're not, this isn't the only option out there, but this is what we use. And this is what I'm gonna show you uh, in the data as we go forward here. Um, I'm gonna start with just the components of, of corn yield a little bit. And I do this because I wanna talk about the development of corn as it relates to silage yield and quality later on. And a big part of silage yield and quality is the grain that's present in that silage. When we look at the components of yield, basically we start with that seed as we drop it in the ground and the number of plants that come up is really the first component of yield. From that point on, basically we see a attrition of the number of plants that survive in that field, either due to cutworm or cultivator blight or lots of different things can impact the number of plants that are out there in the field. But we're at our best potential as we drop that seed in the ground. And so plant population is really kind of a key thing here. The next one is kernel number, which is a function of number of rows and kernels along each row. And this is determined later in the season about the V5 to V6 stage and kind of finalized right at pollination. And then finally, you got kernel weight, which is at its best potential seven to 10 days after pollination and then actually realized at, at the black layer stage later on, given the kind of environment that, uh, that that corn plant is experiencing. But these three yields, yield component traits are really determined at very different times during the growing season. And you can see at this V, at the tasseling stage or the R1 stage, a lot of these components kind of come together, if you will, to to really determine the amount of grain that you can have in silage or your grain yields later on. Once we get past pollination, really the only yield component left is, is kernel weight and uh, the size of those kernels as, as it goes, uh, as, as it continues development. Now, when we talk about corn silage, typical corn silage, um, roughly about half of that corn silage is grain and the other half is, is stover. Um, corn silage typically runs about 30% starch content. A half of the dry, mate, dry, dry weight of that silage pile is, is, um, is, um, is grain. And that grain is 80 to 98% digestible, okay? On the other side is a stover side. And basically in this stover, there's about 50 to 55 percent of that of that pile is is of that dry matter is is stover, but only about 40 to 70 percent of that stover is digestible. And we measure the stover digestibility using NDFD. And a lot of things influence how much how starch how digestible the starch pool is going to be and how digestible the the um, the stover pool is going to be. But just kind of realize that 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 about half of that stover pool is going to be is going to be digested. Now we know that this impacts in the case of, of dairy cows uh, the um, the amount of milk production that that can occur. Uh, really, that that energy that's in that diet is really a function of fiber and starch, um, and that fiber is always going to be lower energy than starch. And if you see a two to three unit drop in fiber or starch digestibility, you'll decrease your milk yields about one pound per day um, as you go through time. Now, if there's one slide I'd like you to really pay attention to, it's this one here. Um, and what I wanna do is go through the kind of the normal pattern of corn forage and, and grain development. And I wanna do this over the life cycle of, of corn. So along the bottom here, we've got different dates and typically roughly when we, we achieve those different dates. The silking stage is right in around this July 15th period and, and that's where we're at now. And then I've got the relative measure. In other words, if we look at any one of the measures we're gonna look at here, where is it at its best? 
and where does it really start to tail off? And the first measure I wanna look at is quality. And we, again, we estimate quality here using milk per ton as that estimate. And if we look at it for corn silage, basically what we see is what's called a double peak for corn silage. We see one peak right around the flowering time or the silking time of, of, of corn. And that's very similar to other forages like alfalfa or, or other things. And like alfalfa, corn silage quality goes downhill relatively quickly. But as that grain starts to come on, we actually see a second peak where we see um, where, the, where we have maximum starch content. And that peak is, is always typically a little bit higher than the first peak. So we have this double peak that goes on uh, with quality in terms of corn silage. Now, what I wanna do is look at the individual components here a little bit. And the first one I wanna look at is the stover pool of energy in corn silage. And if we were to graph that out, it looks like this. Of course, the highest quality is gonna be right around that silking stage of development or earlier. But as we go on into the, into the uh, development stage, further into grain development, we see a decrease in NDFD but it's not typically all that great. In other words, it goes from about right around the silking stage of about 98% uh, or so down to about 90% by the R5 or the dense stage of, of corn development. So there's a little bit of a, a drop off going on here, but it's not very dramatic. The dramatic part of corn silage is really what happens with grain. And we have this around pollination, we've got kind of a lag period followed by a linear period, and then followed by another lag period at maturation. This linear period is typically about 40 days. And what I always tell growers here, if you want a 200 bushel yield, you've got to have basically five bushels a day over that 40 day period to be able to achieve that 200 bushel yield. But this is where we get a lot of our yield uh, with corn. And I just wanna point out the, the differences in the shape here. We have got a gradual tailing off of the NDFD. We've got a fairly dramatic increase that goes on, uh, on with the starch. So if we look at milk per acre, which is a combination of the quality, milk per ton, times the yield, we see our best milk per acre or beef per acre or whatever at this about R5.5 5 to R6. A couple of other things to, to, pay, to pay attention to here is that, first of all, forage moisture typically uh, is at its highest right around that silking time, and then it gradually decreases, but it's a relatively slow decrease until the grain really starts to come on, okay? And when we look at grain moisture, typically the grain moisture right around normal har silage harvest time is oftentimes drier than the whole plant moisture. So the grain moisture is, is drier. So that means the stover moisture is a lot more than the whole plant moisture uh, that, that we typically would see here. So we see this difference, if you will, between the moistures of the stover pool and the grain pool that are out there. And I always tell growers that if, they, if a chopper shows up at their door, one way to adjust your moisture is to raise your cutter bar because what you're doing is, is drying out that, that, that silage um, because you got drier, more drier grain in that stover, in, in that silage, and that stover is, what's, is, um, is what you're leaving in the field. But this relationship is, is um, really important as we enter this time of the year, this pollination time. If pollination is poor, then you can harvest silage for or corn for silage really at any time. If it's fair, in other words, if you get a little bit of pollination going on, then you really can leave that for silage harvest later on. And of course, if it's good, you can use it for normal management, either for silage or, or grain later on. But the point I wanna make here with all of this is that uh, when it's poor, there's no real reason to rush out there and take revenge on these, on these fields. Uh, the, the moisture is going to hold, it's, it's going to be wetter than you think, and that stover pool is actually going to be maintained 
the silver quality pool, the NDFD is going to be fairly, fairly well maintained throughout much of the life cycle. And in fact, we don't have a lot of data on this, but I would argue that since there's no sink for that, for the photosynthate of the plants to get into the grain, you can actually have sugars back up into the stock and into the leaves and actually have what we call sugar corn, basically, that will have some fairly high, high carbohydrate uh, amounts, but, um, uh, but not, have that, not have that grain in it. The tough thing to watch, though, is these fields drying up, of course, and, and um, to see, you know, the plants just don't look like they're growing at all. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually, eventually they, do, they do turn brown and that sort of thing. But, but, but the point I want to make here is that this is a fairly, fairly slow drop off here in terms of quality. And if you would get some rain, like the, if, if rain is forecast a little bit, sometimes that crop can recover. And I'm going to show you some examples of this in a little bit here. Okay, so once you get to this, of course, there's, there's different uses at different times uh, during the season, but these are typically when we would use and look at harvest times for these different, uh, different types of uses with corn silage. Now, one of the things that, of course, we're really concerned about is, is, is the amount of pollination that can occur. And this is some data from Jim Coors and Ken Albrick that was published a while ago that looked at, basic, what they did basically was cover up the year, entire, the year entire, entirely to prevent pollination. And then what they did was they use a, a surgical technique to basically allow half of the plant to pollinate. And then they've got a control where they allow the plant to pollinate normally. And you can see here that forage yield decreased as, you, as the year was not allowed to grow. Okay, and this would be on fairly wet conditions. This was 1992 and 93. So these were fairly wet conditions during those years. And then you can look at what happens with the NDF as well as ADF and digestibility of that silage, uh, even though uh, that corn plant was prevented from, from uh, pollinating and going through uh, grain fill. Okay, so that's kind of one example. Um, another set of data that I just wanna share with you quickly is what we actually have experienced in our UW corn silage performance trials. We started this program in 1995, and so we've got 27, 28 years now of, of data on this. And we've had some drought years and drought situations over that time. What I did for these next slides that I'm going to show you is I took weather data that, and summarized the data from April 1st to July 14th. In other words, from when we're planting through the tasseling stage of development. And I classified them into really uh, five different categories, actually six, cool years, warm years, dry years, wet years, and then where you have the extreme where it can be cool and wet or warm and dry. And of course, what, we're ex what you're experiencing in Missouri now is this warm, dry uh, kind of a situation right here. But I'm just taking the weather data that characterized the year up through July 14th and the growing season and using that to break these this data set into these kinds of environments or years, okay? And, um, and I just wanna show you a couple of examples here of what we experienced during this time. So this is 2005 at Arlington. And uh, we went along the season and then the water just basically shut off. And by the time we hit about July 14th, 15th, we were nine to 10 inches behind in our, in our uh, precipitation and literally, the corn plants quit growing. I remember that year I could stand in the field. I'm fairly tall, but I could look across the field and the, the, the plants were that short. And we had a lot of pineapple occurring and that sort of a thing. The same thing happened in 2012, where again, the rains just kind of shut off and we got to about nine to 10 inches behind and um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the um, pre accumulative pre precipitation. But then beginning about July 18th in 2005, we got some fairly good rains. And those, those, that accumulation was really kind of normal from that point on, but we had a drought during this period right here. The same thing happened in 2012. This was one of our drier years that we've had recently. And we, we saw overall state yields go down quite a bit, but at Arlington, we got some significant rains at that time and we didn't catch up, 
to the same rate of accumulation, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't quite as bad. So that's somewhat unique compared to a year like 1998, where kind of the mother of all drought years occurred, where we just got little bits of rain and then high temperatures. And that's kind of where you're at right now. Unfortunately, I don't have any silage yield and quality data from that year, but I just wanna show you what happened with these different environments as we go, as we go through uh, these different years. So um, if you look at the overall average across this entire data, data set from 1995 to 2021, it's about 6,662 plots. The overall yield average is 10.8 tons of dry matter per acre. When we look at years that were either cool or warm compared to the average, and the average, these cool and warm years are plus or minus one standard deviation from the average, basically we don't see a lot of effect due to temperature uh, on, these, on these plots. What really starts to impact yield is of course precipitation. And because we got these good rains, even though it was dry early on, we got some kind of rains during pollination that allowed that plant to grow fairly well we actually see a little bit better performance under a dry environment than we do under a wet, wet environment. And I think a lot of this has to do with the root system that's, that, uh, that evolves out there. And when we see the extreme years of cool, wet, and warm, dry, uh, basically it's a similar kind of response. They're always yielding lower than the average, but um, typically they're they're um, uh, a little bit lower yielding, but not dramatically. And again, think about what happened during those 2005, 2012, 2021 years. All right, just a little bit on the quality. I'm gonna look at NDFD first. This is a Stover part. Again, overall, we typically see about 60% NDFD. In cool or warm years, it goes up a little bit. Uh, and then when precipitation, when we look at dry versus wet, we actually see a little bit higher digestibility with the dry conditions versus uh, the wet conditions. And then when we look at the extreme years where they're cool, wet, or warm and dry, um, what really hammers us the most more is, is really the cool, wet kinds of conditions compared to the uh, warm, dry conditions. So that's NDFD. And then one more starch content. Uh, overall, typically we see across this time period about 29% uh, starch content. Um, and when we get to cool and warm types of years, we actually see an increase. When we see that stress early on, we actually see less stover produced. And, and when the rains come and, and kind of relieve that pressure a little bit, we actually see very high starch content that uh, basically makes the corn silage relatively hot, as the uh, dairy nutritionists say, and can be a problem feeding out for, um, uh, uh, for uh, cow health uh, reasons. But again, these years we had some rain that came later on, um, uh, oftentimes in, in the, I'm sorry, um, I'm talking about this one here, rain came later on and uh, increased that starch content. Again, the cool wet conditions seem to be worse than the warm dry conditions. Um, and, um, and again, that's typically what we've seen for this first half of the growing season. Now, as this drought continues, um, I don't have a lot of data points uh, for, for that sort of a thing, but, but I would expect uh, this to be wildly different. But really it all kind of comes down to, you know, determining the, sec the success of the pollination phase that we're in right now. And there's two ways to do this. One, you can carefully peel back the husk and do a shake test. Any ovule that's been, been fertilized, basically the silk will fall off. And, um, and so, so that's uh, kind of what to look for there. Or the other way is to wait 10 days and then see if there's ovules that are developing. They'll typically appear very, water, very watery uh, types of blisters. If pollination is poor, then you can harvest any time. It's fair, leave for silage harvest. If it's good, then normal management. So I got a couple more slides here, but just some final thoughts on this here. One of the things that I think we did in 2012 that a, a few growers did was they went out and harvested really early and, and 
they harvested around July 7th or so. And um, they were, I, I don't know, I, I called it revenge, but, but um, if they would have just waited a little bit, they probably would have ended up with a little bit more, a little bit better yield and quality of that corn silage because that pollination phase is, is just so critical for, for the development of that, of that crop. One of the things that corn will do is it'll compress its life cycle. Leaves will emerge faster in a drought. They'll be smaller. And if you can just get enough rain to get through that pollination period sometimes, you can oftentimes make, um, uh, make it can make a difference, a big difference, just by waiting even a week or so. And remember that stover quality doesn't change all that much through that life cycle. The other thing is that bioengineered hybrids really seem to be helping in a drought situation. And the most important trait is a corn borer trait. You know, when you think about a, a, a molecule of water and corn borer typically is characterized by, uh, is, is, is tunneling in the stock. And if you think of that water trying to get to a place where it can really do the work it needs to do, in other words, um, uh, cool the leaf surface off. If there's a bunch of tunnels or that stalk is interrupted a lot, that's, that water molecule won't be very efficient at moving to do its job of cooling down, cooling down the plant. And the corn borer trade is really important, I think, for keeping that stock integrity out there. Drought guard is another one. However, there's very little data that we've got in a drought situation. We've seen these do well in a normal situation but very little information about how this performs in a, in, a, in, a, in a drought situation. I would expect the yield and quality of these to be very similar to, to just other types of corn. Uh, another one is um, in a drought situation, corn forage is wetter than you think. Remember that one slide where, you know, we're looking at 90 to 95% moisture oftentimes during normal times. Um, really what you have to do more than likely is cut it with some sort of a hay bind or something and, and dry it a little bit before you chop and storage, store it. You're gonna see increased ash content, but um, I think you're gonna, it'll be much better in terms of the quality of the, any kind of forage that you could put up uh, in, that, in that pile. Uh, nitrates usually are usually not a problem unless you start to see new growth occurring at the base of the plant. Nitrate typically um, occurs or, or accumulates uh, around where tillers start to grow. And in corn, those tillers typically don't, aren't expressed, but they're all growing right around the lower part of that, of that plant. Oftentimes, nitrates can um, form a gas and will dissipate over time uh, once, they're, once, they're, once you get things into storage, if there is a problem. Um, but of course, if there is, um, you know, one of the things you can do is, is um, you know, look at it, trying to feed a little bit to uh, cull cows or, or whatever. Uh, but when you start looking at trying to preserve that forage that's out there, really, you got to look at what that moisture is for the storage structure you're going to put it in. And then regardless, you're going to need to pack it well and seal it as best you can so that you get good fermentation and, and preservation of that forage. I just wanna to point to another uh, uh, website that might be useful and, and talks a little, goes into a little more detail about this and that's handling uh, uh, corn during, during a drought situation. Uh, just a word about nitrates. Uh, this is some data from Dale Hicks and basically he broke the plant into a number of different plant parts and you can see the, the biggest uh, the, the biggest concentration of nitrate is in that lower one third of the stock. So if there is concern, one of the things you can do is, you know, raise a cutter bar a little bit, but I don't, the plant indicator for higher nitrates oftentimes is um, new growth at the base of the plant. And, um, and that's what you should be really looking for. If you're concerned, you know, send a sample to a forage testing lab, feed it to a few cull cows, uh, you know, that sort of the thing. One of the other things uh, oftentimes that growers wrestle with, especially in relation to nitrates is cutting height. Uh, again, this is for normal silage. We don't see a lot for, I don't have a lot of data for drought, droughted silage, but by raising the cutter bar one foot, what we do is we decrease silage yield about 15%. 
but we actually increased milk per ton because we got more grain to stover in that, in that silage. So our overall milk per acre only goes down about, you know, four, four percentage points or so. And yet we can swing that moisture up to about five units, five moisture units uh, of, of, um, of moisture uh, just by raising that cutter bar. And then finally, um, as far as harvest timing, a, a good grab test method is that was developed again by Dale Hicks in Minnesota. Um, you know, just grab grab the chopped silage. You know, if it's if it's it's usually 75 to 85 percent of the juice runs freely or shows on your fingers. If it forms a ball, it's about 70 to 80, 75 percent. If it expands slowly with no dampness on your on your hand, then it's about 60 to 70 percent. And if it doesn't form a ball at all, then you're down below 60 percent. So that's a quick way to kind of uh, get a feel for. Uh, just get looking at what the moisture is as you try to put this up. And again, droughted corn is going to look wetter than, than it, than it, it's going to be wetter than it looks. And of course, there's always a coster microwave and NIR to uh, basically get at a little better measurement. So with that, I'll stop. Um, I, I um, have some other slides, but I think that's good for now. And uh, and I just wanted to maybe stop if we got time for questions. Otherwise, um, um, we'll turn it over to Craig and the next speaker. I appreciate it, Joe. Appreciate it so much. Um, did we have any questions in the chat box? Craig, we just we have one question at this point. We wanted to ask Joe uh, about his thoughts on the quality difference and nitrate possible issues of uh, baleage, basically wrapping them up in a bale and then sticking them in, in a uh, tube liner versus chopped silage. What he thought about the differences in quality and possible nitrate issues. By a tube liner, do you mean a bag, an egg bag? Is that what yes, you mean? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. But, well, but baling it with a round baler and then putting it in there versus versus actually chopping it and putting it in a bag. Yeah, yeah. The trouble with corn silage is, is that... Um, it's pretty rank stuff, you know. It's it's going to be uh, it's going to be hard to really pack well when you when you um, try to bail it. Um, I think um, I, I assume I assume they're going to handle it much like alfalfa or something like that, and and they're and they're going to try to roll it, get it into a bale. And my concern would be that first of all, whether or not it's dry enough. Mm -hmm. But, but second, um, you know, it might be really tough to handle and even get into a bale. Right. I think the, the better option might be to, to chop it and then put it into a tube or a, an egg bag of some sort to, to uh, be able to seal it and preserve it a little bit. And of course, if you don't have that kind of equipment, you know, they used to just put, you know, dig a hole in the ground and, and, and uh, or either, either try to build some sort of a bunker. Uh, we have a lot of cement bunkers up here in, in Wisconsin, of course, but you know, maybe you could put some round bales up and line it with plastic or something. And, but the, the key is to preserve it, you're gonna need to get it packed well and sealed. And I'm concerned that if you try to, try to bale it, unless it's dry enough, if you try to bale it, it's gonna be, it's gonna get too moldy, it's gonna be too wet. And so, um, uh, but as far as the quality goes, um, if you can do it right, um, there probably won't be a lot of difference between, in other words, this digestibility of that stover is probably not going to be all that different. What I'd be concerned about is, is mycotoxins or, or, um, or, or quality mold issues that can develop as you, as you uh, either try to bale it and or try to bag it. Um, if you, if you bag it, you can probably, I won't say direct chop because I don't know what the moisture is going to be. Um, but regardless, um, you're going to need to do some sort of drying, I think, um, as, as after you cut this crop. I, I would completely agree with you. That yeah. would be the appropriate route to go. Unfortunately, we're pretty limited in Southern Missouri on how many choppers, custom choppers are available. Yeah. And so guys are finding they can't get a chopper. So I would estimate, I don't know, Tim might 
uh, speak in here, I would estimate a third to maybe even more, maybe even half of this corn in our area is being just what you said. They're running a, a hay bine over it. And then they're coming behind the hay bine with a round bale or baling it up yeah. right. and, th and oh. then trying to put it in a, in a tube liner. Yep. Uh, remember, remember though, guys, that, that you've got time. I mean, the, the quality of that corn silage, I mean, it looks ugly and it's hard to, it's hard to hold yourself back. Um, but that quality, that NDF quality doesn't change dramatically over that time. And if you get rain, there's a good chance as well that, you know, you can have sugars accumulate in that stock. The trouble with that though, is you, you really have to watch it then with nitrate accumulation at the base of the plant. Yeah. And that would be a, and that'd be something that would be, uh, you know, you really want to watch that. Um, but, you know, there's only so many nitrates out there. If you can let it grow a little bit longer, if there, if there was green growth and developing at, at, at the base of the plant, let it grow a little bit longer and a lot of that nitrate problem will solve itself either in new tissue being developed or dilution out uh, in, in some way. But that's what you're balancing against is, is um, the quality. But remember what you got right now is not gonna change all that much. And they've got time on, on harvesting. If you harvest in two, three weeks, I don't know if it's gonna make that much difference as long as you're at the right moisture. Yeah, Joe, I would also add that that uh, one of the reasons we've asked you to come on now instead of later is because we're in an emergency situation. In fact, the governor may have already signed a, a state of emergency. And so people don't have any pastures. They don't really, they can't access hay. All of the hay is bought up. And so really they're just trying to chop and feed uh, instead of culling their herd. Yeah. That's the problem that they're having. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if they, my thought on this, and maybe some can comment on this, is if they cut it high and use a crimper and let it dry, possibly they could roll it up that way. I don't know. Uh, but it's it's gotten to be an emergency situation for our beef producers. We're the, I guess you could say, the number two beef herd in the U.S. So people are not looking at this as milk yield as much. Right. But that's what's got. That's what's going on. That's why we're getting all these questions. That's why we're glad you, that you've come on today. And, so I've uh, got a couple more questions, Craig. That's come in. One is: Would these rules apply even if the corn plants have very little to no ear development and the plant right. is burning up? Would you still say the same thing, Joe? To wait? Yep, I, I would because because again, that one graph where I showed the development of yield and quality. You know, that stover, that NDFD, the digestibility of the stover is just a gradual slow decline for the rest of the season. And so, you know, you can wait a little bit. Um, the, again, what you're, what you're banging your head against is what's the moisture of those plants? And you can't go beyond what the storage structure is going to call for. Right. So uh, all I'm saying is uh, don't, don't, do revenge. <laughs> I mean, we got some, there's some time here. That, and, and like I say, even these droughted plants are actually wetter than you think. And what you really need to do is maybe the agents, county agents or specialists can help a little bit is just knowing what that moisture is in some of those droughted fields out there. And if it drops below 70%, well, then they got to cut. Then they got to be out there cutting it. And because that, at that point, you know, you're, um, you're, you're good for a lot of different storage structures at that point. Two more questions. How much will nitrate drop through the ensiling process and how important is it to cover the pile? Well, it's critical to cover the pile. That's the number one thing you got to do. You got you to gotta pack it well and you got to cover it and you got to seal it just to get that fermentation. Once you expose it then, if there's any nitrogen in there, it's a, it's a gas, and that nitrogen is going to dissipate, uh, you know, over time. Typically, it takes about 28 days or so. There is some safety risk involved here, especially if you're in a silo uh, situation. But um, you know, uh, be concerned about that. Um, but typically, that will convert relatively quickly, and a lot of those nitrates will. Will uh, will dissipate out as a gas. 
Craig, that's Craig. all the questions I have. Craig might be able to answer that a little better than me. I, no, <laughs> I'm 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 the Clostridia expert. When I I see I get it sealed fine. It's just too wet going in. Yeah. No, I appreciate this, Joe. You've done a big favor uh, to the Missouri cattlemen, and thank you so much for coming on. I think it's best now to uh, turn this over to Joe. Let me see. Uh, can you uh, yep. unshare? Yeah, and I'll yeah. I'll go yeah. ahead and share. So just to introduce. Um, Joe Horner and Joe I don't know if this is the final title that that you have but this is the one that you got right now so uh, if you could go ahead and start your presentation I've unshared and can let you share your screen looks good okay can you see me yes all right thanks Craig uh, and thanks to Joe for uh, making time to come on and, and talk to us about this. A lot of quality issues that I'm going to talk about in the pricing uh, are very critical on how that is put product is put up. Um, this seems trivial, but I'm just going to remind everybody uh, the crop farmer, what he's willing to price his corn silage. If it's really drought stress is the least he's willing to take is accept is the dollars per acre for his next best alternative, whether that is just plowing the product back down and keeping that fertility there or selling it uh, for grain or uh, selling it to another livestock producer for a better bid. And the livestock producer, he's most willing to pay, the most he's willing to pay is the cost per ton of equally nutritious alternative feed or feeding his cows a different way. So we created a tool to help buyer and seller negotiate on local conditions because we've got a huge difference in the state of Missouri right now on the quality and the quantity we've got in corn silage. North of I-70, we've got some 200 bushel corn silage. Um, Southwest Missouri, where our beef cows are, we've got a D2 drought in parts of it. So um, there's gonna be huge differences across the state in how you're gonna price this product. Uh, we've got an up-to-date guide sheet, uh, just updated everything on it in July. Um, you can go to this website and you can download the guide sheet and work through the formulas. Uh, or if you want to download uh, the spreadsheet uh, or if any extension person wants to download it for their local area and run the numbers through, it's not a very uh, laborious process. And what it will do is it price the uh, standing crop. It'll put it on a wet ton basis um, and then it'll add the chop, your local chopping costs and it will add in based on what storage system you're using, it will add in uh, expected uh, losses. And then you can override those if you want to. But when you get all done, you've got a cost of silage delivered to the feed bunk for the livestock guy, both on a wet ton and a dry matter basis. And hopefully this tool will allow producers to make some good decisions and not uh, make some mistakes. And we know that a lot of this is swag because we know there's a lot of moisture changing. There's a lot of volume changes. There's a lot of yield that's just guessed. But we also know the crop insurance are out there uh, riding off uh, crops and people are pulling in choppers and things are moving pretty quick. So with that, I'll, I'll just do a little bit of a demonstration. If you pull down that, that spreadsheet and you run through the numbers, uh, you put your estimated grain yield, your estimated silage yield. If you're looking for how those two go together within that guide sheet, and within the spreadsheet itself, we've got a little table with an estimated grain yield and an estimated silage yield on a wet and dry basis. Um, your dry matter of your silage, um, what kind of method you're using uh, for ensiling that stuff. And we've got a pick list down here of all the different uh, conventional uh, towers, silage bags, covered stacks, uncovered stacks, and wrapped bales of uh, an estimated loss and walks through, we put $6 corn, corn prices dropped like a rock the last 10 days, which reminds people in Southwest Missouri that uh, we're not 2012, we've got feed alternatives in other parts of the country. We wouldn't be dropping the price of corn this much uh, without good crops coming in other places. And we've got um, the hope for declining corn prices and declining uh, relative feed values on the other co-products. So in this case, with 100 bushel corn, 14, ton uh, yield of corn silage, 
we've got a cost of silage delivering the feed bunk if it's going into uh, silage bags of about $67.74 uh, uh, as fed ton going into the livestock or about $193 on a dry matter basis. And we've got a break even price on the standing crop about $579 uh, per acre in this. Now, I fully realize that we've got everything from 150 bushel corn the further north you go to no grain, just basically recovering your fertility. So we've run a system of set of scenarios through uh, our pricing tool, and it will give you from the crop farmer's perspective what he needs, the least he can accept, both standing and silage delivered wet ton, uh, the least he can accept and come out even with, with the next best alternative, either selling for grain or just plowing the fertility right back down. From the livestock farmer standpoint, we've just taken that the numbers above and factored in the wastage uh, and the loss and figured out what his cost per as fed ton and what his cost per dry matter ton are. And keep in mind over here on no grain, which is what a, a lot of folks in Southern Missouri are looking at. Uh, if you got no grain in there, this number is the absolute minimum that a crop farmer would be willing to allow somebody to chop his crop off. Uh, I don't think that you want to accept for that because that doesn't recover anything but the P and K that's being removed from his farm. He can negotiate up from there. But the other thing I'd encourage people to do is to take a look at the system that you're using to preserve that because the price per ton of dry matter fed to your livestock is gonna depend on how much losses you've got into that case. And in this case, I've got a side-by-side -side example of 20 bushel yield, eight ton of the acre corn silage, um, and I've got it as baleage in one example and as a silage bag in the other example. So one is chopped and the other is cut down with um, hay bind and then um, big round baled and stuffed to an inline tube wrapper. Uh, like a lot of what we did in 2012 and a lot of it's going on right now. Uh, we estimated 18% storage loss as this and about 12% storage loss in a, a silage bag. Uh, the same price on all the all the fertility and everything like that. And when we get down to the bottom line, we've got $28 a ton and, and basically harvest charges with a big baling and stuffing in an inline chopper and $8 a ton with chopping, $2 delivery versus $4 delivery if you're delivering uh, truckloads of chopped silage. Um, and then $8 for the plastic and the, the wrapper and $5 uh, for the plastic and the stuffer on the ag bag. Come down bottom line is uh, in, in a baleage, even with a 45% moisture uh, dry matter or 45% dry matter versus 35% in the silage bag, um, we've got a cost per ton of dry matter of $144 in this case uh, and $108 in this case. And this was pricing it basically just uh, barely recovering the cost for the, the guy that's raising the corn. Just making an example that uh, the storage system you're using can make a big difference in the cost of delivered ton because of the wastage and loss. Finally, what the livestock guy is willing to pay. Um, you know, I focus a lot on dairy and um, we've got this feed valve program we can run on daily on upgraded feed prices. Crack corn at 625 and soybean meal at $400 a ton it would value your good, your fair quality corn silage about 1180 per, per ton of dry matter. So over $220 a ton of dry matter. That's probably way on the high side for beef guys who can tolerate a lot of rougher roughage. But if we look over at what the Department of Agriculture says, hay prices are going on in the state of Missouri. Statewide, we, don't, we haven't seen the tightness that we've seen in 2012 where we were raising in bahia grass and peanut holes and all kinds of things. Uh, hay prices are steady as of last week. Uh, the hay supply is moderate. There's not a lot trading yet. There is a lot being put up um, in particularly in North Missouri and they've still got prices of 60 to $140 a ton. So just remind people that um, it may be panic time for a lot of producers in Southwest Missouri They may be calling herds and maybe uh, worried about forage supplies and water supplies, but 
as of right now, this is not the 2012 kind of situation because you don't have to go that far before you get into good crops. With that, I ran four minutes over, Craig, so I'll turn it back to you. Well, um, you did you did well speeding through that anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, questions for Joe, are there questions, uh, Wesley? I don't have any questions uh, in the chat box, but again, kind of like you said, Craig, I really want to thank Joe for helping us think about different perspectives from pricing it. Yeah, so the, I met I met Joe Horner. We got two Joes on today, so yeah. Any 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 closing questions? And Joe, I'm going to need the screen if you'll let me have it. Any closing questions uh, uh, for the town hall today? If not. I'm going to uh, share this screen if I can. I've got to play play a little game with my with my. So we're going to close out today. Thank you everybody for for joining. We would like to say as a reminder that you can find these recordings uh, at this URL here. Um, also, remember to stay tuned. Uh, we are going to be hitting this drought topic quite a bit. In fact, August the 11th. Stacy Hamilton will talk to us about alternative pastures for the winter. What's happening is people are feeding the hay because that's all they have. And so they are looking for winter feeding systems. And Stacy has quite a bit of experience planting some of the cereal grasses, the wheat, triticale, oats, rye, and so on. That's August the 11th. Um, also, uh, we just want to uh, wish everyone a good week ahead and hope to see you see you the next time our next town hall will be dealing with fertility soil fertility for the fall any other questions uh, from the group all right everybody thank you so much for joining and we'll see you next week and thank you especially to joe lauer thank you joe